This is part 12 of the doctrine of business. We've called it God's debt system, divine economic and business transaction system. We are in Ephesians chapter 6, and though we're going to review some of the principles of this particular system, we're going to also um, glean some new material. Actually, this is uh, a doctrine that um, you probably could not exhaust in a year, but uh, we're going to have to, to do so, but try to get it as comprehensively as possible. We've learned quite a bit. We've covered quite a bit of material, and I hope it's uh, benefited you. I know the other Sunday I had about 12 people to raise their hands regarding this, and uh, that's important. People are thinking. People are moving toward the Bible perspective on, on business. Now, mind you, we have a current administration uh, that is anti-Bible, anti-fundamentalist, anti-God's view on business. And uh, it's going to get bad, believe you me. Now, it may seem to get better before it gets worse, but um, and the reason I say that is because at first everybody's going to be excited and hop on the bandwagon and so forth. But uh, only God's systems uh, work. And so, therefore, we must know God's system. And again, one of the reasons that I want to teach it is because I believe that you and I are living in the generation where we are beginning to see already the coming together of the economic system of the beast or Antichrist. So the first thing we learned about uh, God's system is that employers have to be responsible for people. They just can't simply um, hire and fire in an irresponsible fashion. Uh, if they hire somebody, then uh, they've got to give them a job to do and pay them accordingly. They must also be impartial toward them. And this, of course, takes care of things like racism and the like. If someone, regardless of who they are, does some work for you at an agreed price, you are to pay them regardless if they do their job. So toward your employees, you must have this particular type of attitude. And in verse number nine, it says, ye masters, do the same things to them, the servants, forbearing threatening. Now remember we said that this didn't mean that you couldn't threaten. It's just that you didn't do it repeatedly and that it was not to be a means of motivation. Let the motivation be profit. Let the motivation be filling their bellies and taking care of their families. That's a good motivation so that you can forbear threatening. But now if it's necessary, just like it is with our young people, you don't spank all the time. But if it's necessary, there comes a time when you have to do it. Knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is a respect of persons with him. There shows the impartiality. Now, what are these masters to do? Well, middle part of verse 5. With fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, serve or obey Jesus Christ. He's the heavenly master. Not with eye service. You know, so much of what we do on the job is just simply to please an employer or actually to be busy when he's watching. <laughs> When he's not watching, then we tend to loaf, we tend to slack off, but you can't do that. The Bible forbids it. If you're on the job, whether they are watching you or not, you don't need a big brother government. You don't need a big brother employer. You've got someone over you, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you are to serve. Therefore, it's not simply with a superficial eye service and as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. And note, the Apostle Paul associates doing a good job, your profession, your occupation, your business, with the will of God. Not everybody's a missionary. Not everybody's an evangelist. Not everybody is a pastor. But everybody has a ministry. That is, where you are, your business is your ministry. Now note the two things here. It says, verse number 9, Knowing that your master, middle part of the verse, is also in heaven, Verse 5, servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Now we're going to make a point here, and it's a very, very important point regarding equality. 
Today, again, I just simply refer to the current administration of inclusiveness. It's, it's interesting that uh, as far as inclusiveness is concerned, I don't see any fundamentalist on uh, President Clinton's uh, cabinet, any of his advisors. Fundamentalists not welcome. Conservatives not welcome. Uh, we're, we're supposed to get a cross-section of America. Uh, where's the cross-section of America? It's nonsense. Uh, you have people there, there are more gays involved in politics, and one of the first things he did coming to office was say, you're allowed to have gays in the military. So one of the first things that he did, and so therefore you're not going to find somebody who's a Bible believer who says, look, uh, you cannot have this in the military service. That's one of the very first things he did. It's because of his liberalism. But the point here is that the inclusiveness of the divine system uh, whenever Jojo, Jojo's restaurant out here uh, was, um, was forming, they would get together for these brainstorming sessions with all their employees to get, quote, input. It's interesting that they lost half of their employees uh, because they had to let them go. Why? Because they weren't giving good input. That's, that's the point. The point is this. There isn't such a thing as equality when you're talking about employer-employee relationships. There is superiority. And that's what this word master implies. You can't be equal as employer and employee. Now, yes, you can be friends, but you must be very careful about buddy-buddy about because there's going to come a time when you're going to give an order. Kurios is the, is the word, Greek word, for master. When it applies to God, we saw this Wednesday night, it is supreme in authority. God is over all. But when it applies to man, it means predominant in authority. If you're a dad, your word's final. If you're a husband, excuse me, your word's final. If, you, if you're a president, we still have to obey those in authority over us, even though we cry against them for their sin. Business, so forth, school teachers, whatever, uh, it means predominant in authority. If there's a young person in class cutting up and you say, please close your mouth, open your book, and get your pen and pencil and, and write, what does that young person have to do? Exactly what you tell them to do. I don't have to listen to you. Yeah, I'll tell you what, you had my old sixth grade teacher, uh, you'd, you'd have to listen. She'd pop you in the nose. And there wasn't any of these uh, parent-teacher things coming together with, uh, you know, she'd throw them out on their ear too. Uh, that's nonsense. Now, uh, yes, there can be abusiveness, but we're talking about teaching young people respect for authority, and they are superior. It doesn't matter if you like them or not. It doesn't matter if they have a good personality or not, if they come in grumpy or not. That's not the, that's not the point. The point is, if they come in grumpy and give you an order, it's still a valid order. They're a kurios, you see. And God is teaching a lesson here that... Uh, Despite the fact of an authority, Lucifer charged God with being a bad authority. You don't know how to run things. I can run things better. And God said, look, my system works regardless of who the authority is personality-wise. As long as he does the job correctly, regardless of his personality, he, you're to listen to him. And so you come on the job and... Uh, you have a bad kurios. You still have to obey him. And you can't answer again, according to the book of Titus. Now, we're going to take a little rabbit's trail here. Anytime we've got the brackets, we're going to, we're going to take a rabbit's trail. But it includes, or um, is a comment, uh, commentary on this word kurios. What does kurios mean? Well, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, please remember, if you are a kurios, a master, an employer, it's, as a good Christian testimony, it would be unwise for you to go in grumpy. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not giving you license to, uh, to have a bad personality. I'm not giving you a license to mistreat anybody uh, and that sort of thing. I'm just saying if, if you as a believer find yourself in that situation, you may not like them personally, but that's irrelevant to the point. The point is, are they your authority or not? 
That's the point. When it comes down to a pastor teacher, that's the whole point. Well, but he doesn't have a sweet, uh, stroking person. Now, he doesn't make all the right clucking noises. So what? Does he teach the Bible, and did the Holy Spirit lead you to him? That's the point. Then he's your kurios, and uh, he's the final authority. The word itself gives positional superiority and authority in a chain of command setting. It doesn't mean that that person necessarily is superior to you in a personal fashion. In, in fact, probably uh, Peter and Paul were addressing believers who were better personally than their bosses. But both of them said, be obedient to those masters over you. Verse 18, it's just good business. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. The word froward there is interesting. It's scolios. We get the word scoliosis from it. What's that mean? Crooked spine. Yeah. Or <laughs> someone uh, lipped warped. It is. Now, it doesn't mean morally crooked. It doesn't mean dishonest. If he's dishonest, turn him in. <laughs> but actually the word means out of line. He can come in and, boy, he didn't get enough sleep last night. Uh, you know, somebody kept him up. The neighbor's dog barked. And he comes in and he's grumpy. But what do you have to do? Obey him. And you can't malign him either. Uh, even those that are forward. Even those who are out of line personally. For this is thankworthy. If a man, Christian, for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrong, wrongfully, what glory is it? When ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. In other words, if, if you're out of line and this guy comes in and rides your case, he's a monkey on your back, he, he, boy, he just gives you what for, and, and he belittles you in front of all of I mean, he just tells you, look, you're not doing your job, I've been patient with you, I'm fed up, do your job, and it's your fault. Glory, God. Thank you, Lord, that I suffered for righteousness. No. Read on. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you did your job, but this guy knows you're a Christian and he is, he is uh, taking it out on you. But if you take it patiently, you don't answer again. You're not a smart aleck. You keep on doing your job. He still rides your case and you don't deserve it. But you take it patiently. Note what it says. That is acceptable with God. That's when God gets glory. So there is a sense of superiority with that word. And it simply means that there is uh, one guy on top and one guy beneath. And the scripture is clear regarding attitudes of the kurios. When it applies to God, supreme in authority, overall, final word. But when it applies to man, it means in that specific category. If he is your employer and you're working for him, then you have to take orders from him. Now, again, I am treading on the ground of the collectivists who say, if I don't like our, our boss, we'll have just a work stoppage, and if they don't give us another boss or what we want, we'll bomb the place, we'll break windows, we'll set fire to the place, we'll intimidate, we'll threaten with uh, uh, life and limb nonsense. You go in there and you do your job as to the Lord, and uh, if he is a, a southern posterior of a mule, you take it patiently. Now, if you want to talk to him, that's fine. If you want to sit down and... and uh, and say, look, um, I really would like to get along with you. That's a different story. But regardless of what he does, as long as he does, does not break the law and injure you and so forth, you must listen. That's kurios. It's a far cry from what we have today in the workplace where people tell off. And, and uh, if you've ever seen them, the movie Gung Ho, every time the company came and said, I would want it done this way, this way, and this way, the other guys were saying, I'm walking. Quit, let's walk. Work stoppage. Obey those in authority over you. Your boss is an authority. He's a kurios. All right. Now, the second thing is we turn to the book of Romans, chapter 13. It 
Second thing about this word is that it implies an ordered structure and form of government that's su supposed to be followed and preserved. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. A kurios, your employer, is a higher power. That's what the first meaning of the word is. He's superior to you. Maybe not personally. You have better moral standards. You're a, you're a better Christian. But so what? On the job, he is still superior to you in position. All right? So the second thing is, is that God himself has designed this to teach the angels a lesson and men as well. And that is in order to keep uh, uh, people secure, in order to ensure stability, domestic tranquility, you've got to have a higher power who calls the shots legitimately. The word higher is hooper echo. Hooper means uh, over and above, to, and echo means to have and to hold. And so in every one of our lives, we have somebody that is over and above us that we hold as our authority. And it's when we start rebelling against those over us that we are directly out of the will of God. No such thing as, as uh, hippies and uh, rebels in, uh, in God's system. Let every soul, mind you, be subject. That means to keep the chain of command unto the higher powers, the authorities over. All right, let's notice two more words that uh, are listed here. For there is no authority but of God. The powers that are in existence are ordained of God. Now, one of the reasons that the Apostle Paul uses the word ordination here is because in verse 4, he calls an authority. Your volition, that's an authority. Your husband, that's an authority. Your father, that's an authority. Your school teacher, that's an authority. Your employer, that's an authority. Here it's referring to civil authorities and primarily um, officers of the law and the court. But it says, he is a minister. He can be unsaved, and yet he's still ordained of God. He's the minister of God to thee for good. God has ordained a system where imperfect men, even unbelieving men, can understand the fall of Lucifer and the trouble that it caused by either obeying or disobeying those in authority over you. And the word tasso means to arrange in an orderly manner. So, Tasso also indicates the most direct line of authority or uh, the authority in a chain of command. All the way to the top. Now remember that everybody has somebody over them but God. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, Masters, you remember that you're to treat them this way because there's somebody over you. You're an earthly master, but you've got a heavenly master that you are ultimately accountable to accountable to. And uh, if you don't treat them right, he eventually is going to uh, judge you for your misbehavior. But it's when we start getting out of line, when we start following another type system, when we do what they did in Judges, every man do that which is right in his own eyes, you can't do it. You must be under an authority. Uh, that's why it's important to have one right pastor. You cannot have three or five or ten pastors. You've got to have one authority. Just like a wife has one husband, children have one father. In a classroom setting, the, the, uh, the, the students there have one teacher. It's just the ultimate authority. All right, so, whosoever therefore resists the power, smart aleck, talk back, I don't have to do it your way, uh, I'm my own person, uh, I'm master of my own fate, nonsense. If you want to do the will of God, then you've got to obey those in authority over you. Then and only then are you within the, the realm of God uh, where you're not going to get any type of, um, of judgment. Now, why do I say that? Whosoever therefore resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. They that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Uh, had uh, uh, 
several folks in the uh, in past year uh, to talk about the fact that um, that our teaching here is quite black and white and they cannot take that. But I like uh, to, to live in gray areas and uh, whenever I talk about being in fellowship and out of fellowship and if you live out of fellowship, God is eventually going to get, get you. They want to hear this liberal business that God is love. Well, that's true. He's love. You know what I'm doing? I'm teaching you where the love of God can be found. Where? In a system. Obey those in authority hey, over you. God says, hey, I love you for doing that. If he's an unbeliever and yet he's out there and he says that uh, you're, you're to keep the speed limit here, you're to do this and public safety here and so forth, uh, and obey those in authority, that is, that's where the love of God is found. But if you're going to rebel or resist or always make it different, then you're out of line as far as God is concerned. This time the word is diatege. Tege comes from tasso. It's derived from that word. To arrange in an orderly manner, thoroughly or throughout. And here's where we get the idea of the pyramid. There's always one man on top. Only one. And the cream always rises to the top. That is uh, in the natural order of things. And there are always those to whom we are responsible all the way to the top. Now, for those who may not understand this pertaining to a church, every time I say, if it's different than the job description, clear it with the pastor first, and you don't do that, do you know what you would, why, why fuss, pastor? Why not just let it go? I, I don't let it go because you're out of the will of God. You're breaking up the system. You don't understand. You have the foggiest idea of what life is all about. The pastor, teacher, as well as others, are authorities in your life, and you clear it with them first. I dare say that uh, we could go to any profession here. If those underneath, you, told, you gave them an order, and they simply said, disregarded the order, went their own way, and did something else contrary to what you told them to do. Now, you know what you'd say? I told you to do it that way. One of the, about the only one, uh, because you hold their paycheck, but the only one that is not respected in that fashion is the pastor teacher because, hey, it's difficult to fire people in a church. You're, you're wanting them to come to church. But, I, but I'm telling you, you're out of the will of God. The pastor's voice is to be heard and he says, this is what we do. And he's in line with the scriptures and you don't show up and you don't listen and you don't learn. And you knowingly, I'm going to do it a different way. Buster, you better watch out. Why? Whosoever resists the power receives to themselves damnation. Now, I'm sorry, I didn't write it. I don't make the rules. But that's just one authority in your life. And uh, uh, time and again, the reason I, I even bring this up is because it deeply bothers me that people think they can get away with it. I don't have to be there. Yes, you do. Who says, Pastor? You're not there. You're not going to get away with it. I guarantee you. Oh, you might, you might live life and you might be happy for a while, but it, it's going to come back on you. God is not a just God to let you get away with it for long. All right. Now, therefore we have the divine establishment institutes. Now, in each of these, you have an authority over you. Now, there are two things. Unless these people are breaking God's laws or man's moral law, for example, your employer is stealing and you know it, then you must turn him in. Or he's breaking God's law, for example, our, our president, um, I'm going to pry against him. Uh, uh, the man and, uh, and his liberal wife, uh, their stand on abortion, their stand on gay rights, uh, and so forth. I'm going to pry against it. I can't help it. They're breaking God's law. They're bringing this nation under the umbrella of the judgment of God. You just wait. And that's what we're studying here. His idea of taxing businesses to put people to work who, who, are, who are too inept and, uh, and uh, incompetent to own up to life. That's wrong. That's stealing. And I'm going to cry against it. 
But as long as he's in authority and uh, and so forth there, we're going to do our best to cry against it. But you just wait. I heard Jerry Falwell this morning say that he believes that there's trouble brewing in, in the current administration for fundamentalists. And you just watch. You just watch and see if we're not heading toward state licensing for ministers. You just watch and see. So I've always said that um, I will probably be in jail because there's no state in this world that's going to license me and, and dictate to me what I'm going to teach. I'm going to teach this Bible, and, uh, and come what may, I'm going to teach the Word. And if they put me in jail, I'm in good company because that's where Paul was, and that's where I believe that uh, a lot of fundamentalist preachers are going to be in the long run. Because of, and if you voted for people that are in the current administration, uh, it just shows your ignorance of the Word of God because those people are devoid of Bible doctrine totally. All right. The word also means to fill or endue with power. It contains the legal right to decide and dispose, and that means your employer. If he says you're to do this particular job, then he's made that decision, and that's the job that he wants you to do. And unless it involves your safety, you have to do that job. All right, we're going to continue on then with the second word. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6. We have, we have extremely uh, bad workplace place ethics and uh, bad attitudes in the workplace. And it's simply because people don't understand that uh, they do not have a right to hurt that employer regardless of his person unless, of course, he is breaking the law and hurting them or, or jeopardizing their safety. Then that's a different story. All right, secondly... Employees, they must be impartially receptive to the authority of the employer and work for the profit of his or that enterprise. Yes, I said, work for them to bring them money. You want job security? Work for, work for a guy and make, make yourself profitable to him. You have job security. Uh, you want stability in your home, you want stability in a nation, work for a fella and do the best that you can to see that, you, that his business thrives and you're, you're a part of making that business profitable so that he can take the money and reinvest it in that business and keep up to date on technology and the machines and, and, and so forth. And you make yourself, your, your skills valuable to him and see if you don't have job security. Now, notice again, servants, verse 5, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Notice, masters according to the flesh. Why? You're to serve them, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ. Again, like the masters, there is a, an ulterior motive here. Not, not only are you trying to make the institution function, the business function and profitable, but just like the master, you're serving somebody uh, that's over you. You have a higher purpose and a higher calling. And maybe this master is unsaved, but it doesn't matter. You're working for him as though Jesus Christ stood. He stood in the stead of Jesus Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul is teaching. So that your earthly service is a reflection simply of your heavenly service. Because you're in the will of God and you want to, to work and you want to show the grace of God through your job and you want to glorify the Lord, then you simply obey this chain of command. Now the word servants here is different from kurios. It's doulos. It's one bound with an obligation or a liability. You're obligated to work and do what the boss says. All right. Now again, this indicates something. Turn with me to the book of First Timothy. Chapter 
6, verses 1 and 2. Now, what about this particular word? It shows positional inferiority and liability. By the way, what, what is the liability? Well, the first liability you have, your debt, is your stomach. Second liability is, if, if the business is not profitable, you go bankrupt. And so you've still got the first liability to own up to, your stomach. It all comes back to your stomach. So, it shows positional inferiority. You have a liability to obey him. Why? Because he's trying to work for a profit, and as his business is profitable, he can pay you and keep that thing going. Now, it doesn't necessarily, as I said before, show uh, personal inferiority. We have countless times here. Uh, it says... They might not be uh, believers, but it doesn't matter. But even if they are believers, you still have to obey. Note, 1 Timothy 6, 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke, who pair echo over and above, who po beneath. You're under a yoke. Count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them. If, if you've got someone who is a believer and they give you an order and uh, somehow, you're, well, boy, that's unfair, this, that, and the other, and I thought they were a Christian, has nothing to do with it. Let them not despise them because they're brethren, but rather do them service. You see? Regardless of their personality, regardless if they're having a bad day, regardless if they're not living up to their testimony, it doesn't matter. You're a doulos, they're a kurios. And as long as you are uh, maintained, they have an understanding that this relationship is maintained. If they say it, you obey it as long as it's legitimate. But rather do them service because they're faithful and beloved partakers of the benefits. These things teach and exhort. And by the way, it's not, it's not the most not the most popular teaching. I've uh, found that out as I have uh, been teaching this over the, the course of the weeks. I'm telling you, people get upset when you hit their socialist, collectivist mentality. They don't want to stand upon their own uh, in the system that God has set up, the correct system, stand upon their own worth and work for somebody. They want to stand beside people and intimidate employers to get their demands and get what they want. And let me tell you, you're out of line. You're a scolios. You're out of the will of God. All right. Now, we uh, discussed these, and uh, what we're going to do is sort of clean them up and discuss them just a little bit further as we turn to the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians, chapter 6. Now, I believe it was Sunday night that I introduced three natural laws. What I'm going to do is go back and sort of reorganize these things, uh, make them just a little more technical, and uh, put, on, uh, put them under another umbrella. There are three important axioms. The first axiom, an axiom is simply a universal principle or truth, uh, one that's generally accepted or understood or known. It's the principle of natural law. And uh, we're going to break this down. We've already studied it under uh, uh, one heading, and that is uh, volitional responsibility. But we're going to break it down to three and then see an additional one that's really vital to this study. All right, Galatians chapter 6. Verse number 7, verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. The word mocked there means to turn your nose up. I don't like to do it that way. That's fine. Just remember, you can turn your nose up now, but there are principles of natural law in effect 
that will eventually get you. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that sows to his spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. So what is the first principle of natural law that's found in this verse? It's called the law of volitional responsibility. You know you have to have some skill, uh, some, some feature about you to make you attra attractive and employable. You know that, at least you should. Your parents should have mentioned this. Uh, teachers at school should have mentioned this. Somewhere along the line, knowing that there are adults out there that work for a living, what do you want to be? I want to be a fireman. I want to be a policeman and so forth. You don't hear many people want to, be, to become pastors nowadays, but uh, that's neither here nor there. I wouldn't wish it on them, except that as the Lord chooses, his will is best. But it says, as a man, you, reaps and sows, he, as he sows, rather, he will reap. Whatever you do, you're going to have to put in the time. But if you don't do anything, remember Proverbs 24? I went by the field of the slothful, by the man void of understanding. The wall was broken down. There were weeds in the ground and thorns up over the, uh, the uh, vines. He's going to reap what he sows. He didn't put in the time, so what does he reap? emptiness, no harvest, no money in his pocket, no money in the bank, no reserves. He reaps what he sows. If you want to prosper at life, then you've got to put in the time toward something. All right, now there's a second law here, and it's called the law of genetical reproduction, and it's found in the words whatsoever and that. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If we go back to the book of Genesis, what is it? After their kind, after their kind, after their kind. They reproduce after their kind. If you put this type of seed in the ground, a carrot a, a seed, a carrot seed is going to come up and so forth. So that whatever you put in the ground as to type of seed, that's the type of crop that you're going to have later on. Whatsoever is going to come up in kind. All right, now there's one more that we want to see here as we turn to the book of Mark. And I'm just about out of time. The book of Mark, chapter 4. And verse number 26. This is called the law of conditional returns. Now, mind you, uh, the, these are axioms that I, I think you should know, that I think you should learn. Why? Uh, simply because if you don't know these, you're not going to understand uh, why certain things happen the way that they do. There's a cause and effect for, for everything. You have to be responsible for your life. Therefore, you have to follow a course of study that will give you skills to prepare you for life, to do a one certain job for life. Secondly, the time that you put in, the quality that you put in, that's the type of thing that you're going to get back. It's uh, genetical. Whatever you add to it, that you're going to get back in kind. But also, there's the law of conditional returns, and that is, between the time of sowing and the time of reaping, there are various factors that, uh, that are involved in the return between planting and harvesting, or the time between planting and harvesting. For example, and I just have a, a minute here, and we'll use this as a springboard into the next hour. Different type of crops mature at different times. For example, uh, the barley crop to Israel came earlier, uh, March, April, then did the wheat crop, which came April, May, 
uh, they would they would plant these things uh, different times because there was a different length of growing season according to the crop, according to the soil, according to the type of care, and according to the type of weather. So using this then as our springboard, we'll take this up next hour, and we're going to see the law then of conditional returns.